Herr Wahl, Herr Weyer, das geht mir ganz schön praktisch, Herr Mernitz, also ein bisschen hoch zu machen. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. So first of all, I'd like to thank Helmut Hofer and the rest of the faculty for the opportunity to be here this semester and also next year. It's a, of course, a wonderful environment, so I'm very grateful and happy to be here. Uh, so I'm going to be discussing symplectic dynamics of integrable systems, and uh, parts of this talk are based on joint work with Hans Deutschmann and San Von Gogh. So the outline of topics is going to be the following. First, I'm going to introduce the setting. Then I'm going to discuss group actions, then integrable systems. And I'm going to conclude with some remarks about spectral theory of integrable <laughs> systems. So let me give you a glimpse of symplectic geometry. Um, and of course, this glimpse is from my own perspective and from the point of view of the things that I have been interested in. So. Um, so the origins are with Hamilton's formulation of Lagrangian mechanics in the early 19th century. And he was reformulated ideas of Galileo, Lagrange, and Newton about the orbits of planetary systems. Symplectic geometry probably became a subject in the early 1970s with the, with the work of Alan Weinstein, the foundational work of Alan Weinstein. And now it seems that symplectic dynamics is also on its way to become a subject. And we have next year a symplectic dynamics year here at the institute. So that's, uh, that's, that's wonderful. Now, symplectic geometry was revolutionized in the early 1980s by the work of Gromov, who introduced J. Holomorphic curves. And they have been used and, uh, by many authors, notably by Helmut Hofer, Jacob Eliasberg, Dusa Maktaf, and many other people. There are yet some more aspects of the subject and these are in red because are the ones that I have been the most interested in myself, which are integrable systems, dynamical systems, microlocal analysis, and PDEs. The first one, this is uh, many authors have contributed to this. For example, Arnold Deussemann, Helmut Hofer again, El Eliasson, Kolmogorov, Constant Ullenbeck. There are lots of names. Um, then there is another aspect which, in which I have also been myself very interested in, which is the structure theory of Lie group actions and the connections with representation theory and algebraic geometry. And many names are here, again, like Atiyah, Odin, Koston, Byrne, Gilleman, Rishitikin, Weinstein. Finally, some more aspects. There is a Fourier theory, um, phase space analysis aspect, which was pioneered by Hans Deussemann and Hermander. And many authors have contributed to this. For example, Colin de Verdier and Jean-Michel Bismuth. And then there are two very large uh, areas. The first, the first one is topology in low dimensions, symplectic topology. Again, some of the names that I have mentioned before are again here, like Hofer, Gomf, Eli Asper, Ullenbeck, Taus. And then there is another very large part, which is uh, the connections to mechanics and Poisson geometry, which were mainly pioneered by Alan Weinstein. And now there is a huge group of people working on this, including Ratu, and many other authors. And every two years, there is a Poisson geometry conference. And uh, probably about 150 people or even more people attend. So it's a very large group of people working on this last part. OK, so this is my perspective of the subject, again, from the point of view of the things that I have been interested in. Uh, so there are probably many other gaps that you can fill in there. So let me introduce with the very basics. Uh, um, of symplectic geometry. So the, the basic object is, of course, a symplectic manifold. So what is a symplectic manifold? Well, first let me tell you what is a symplectic form on a vector space. So this is just linear algebra. So take a vector space B, finite dimensional. A symplectic form on this vector space is a non-degenerate antisymmetric bilinear form. And a symplectic manifold is just smooth manifold. And on each tangent space, you have a symplectic form. And of course, because this smooth manifold, you want the collection of symplectic forms to vary smoothly. And you want a little more, which is you want that the form, this, this form is closed. Now, what are the, the first examples of symplectic manifolds? Well, in dimension two, a symplectic form is the same as an area form. So the first example is, of course, a surface of genus G with any area form. That's a symplectic manifold, which is, um, so for example, take the torus or the sphere. And here is a non-compact example, which is very important, which is R2N, the Euclidean space, with 
the symplectic form which you obtain by taking the wedge of dx1 and dy1 plus dx2 uh, wedge dy2 and so on, where x1 up to xn are the coordinates in R2n. Now you can ask some questions about symplectic manifolds. The first one is, well, how many are there and uh, what type of conditions, for example, a symplectic form imposes on a manifold? Can you always put a symplectic form on a manifold? So you can ask, can you put a symplectic form on the three sphere? Can you put a symplectic form on the Klein bottle? Can you put a symplectic form on the four sphere? So let's answer these questions. So the, the answer to the first question is, uh, no, you cannot put a symplectic form on the three dimensional sphere. It's not symplectic because you cannot put a non-degenerate form. Now, uh, the Klein body is also not symplectic because if you take the wedge product of the symplectic form with itself n times, then you obtain a volume form. So the Klein bottle is also not symplectic. And finally, in the case that your manifold is compact, symplectic manifolds are topologically non-trivial, meaning that the even dimensional, the rank homology groups, they're all non-trivial because if you wedge the symplectic form with itself n times, you obtain, you obtain a non-trivial cohomology class. So all the even dimensional cohomology, uh, uh, the rank cohomology groups are non-trivial and therefore the only spheres that, uh, the only sphere that is symplectic is the two dimensional one. The other ones are not symplectic for one reason or another. Okay. Okay. Now I said at the, at the, when I was giving the first examples of symplectic manifolds that R to N was very important. And the reason is that it's very important is because it, it is the local model for all symplectic manifolds. And this is a theorem that Darbu proved in the, in the late 19th century. Darbu proved that if you look at the symplectic manifold and you look at a point in the manifold, there is a small neighborhood in which the symplectic form looks, in which the symplectic form looks like this product, which you remember is, the, is precisely the symplectic form on R to N. So symplectic manifolds have no local invariance other than the dimension. This is already a striking difference with Riemannian geometry where the curvature is a local invariant. Okay. Now let me go to Hamiltonian dynamics now, which is the topic of my talk. As I said at the beginning, this originated with Galileo, Lagrange, and Newton, probably, and was general, greatly generalized by Hamilton. And here is a picture of, of Will and Hamilton. So let me give you the two basic, uh, perhaps the two basic objects that I'm going to be using in this talk. So I'm going to start with a connected symplectic manifold, which can be compact or not. Uh, sometimes I will assume that it's compact, but sometimes I will not assume that it's not. I will not assume compactness, and this is particularly true for when I discuss integrable systems, where if you require compactness, you re you, you you restrict your set is is too much of a restriction. Okay. So on a smooth manifold, you can consider a smooth vector field, right? On a symplectic manifold. You can consider a symplectic vector field, which is just smooth vector field, but you require that the flow of the vector field preserves the symplectic form. And you can require a little more. You can require that your vector field is Hamiltonian, and this means the following. This means that if you take the symplectic form, and on the first component of the symplectic form, which is a two form, you put the vector field y, that defines a one form, and you require that that one form is exact. This means that there is a smooth solution to this equation. And this is the brief way to state Hamilton's equation. So if there is a global solution H to that equation, then you say that your vector field is Hamiltonian. And you denote it in this way. This German H and then uh, uh, the lower script is capital H. So this is the Hamiltonian vector field generated by the function H. Okay, so these are the two natural objects to consider on a, on a symplectic manifold, symplectic and Hamiltonian vector fields. Now the H here is called the Hamiltonian or the energy function. Now, there is a very easy way to generate uh, uh, vector fields from a torus action, and this is as follows. You t take any torus, so this is a product of K circles, so it's a compact connected abelian Lie group, and assume that this torus acts smoothly on your manifold. And I'm not assuming that this, the manifold is symplectic. Okay, just assume that the torus acts smoothly on your, on, on, 
uh, on a manifold, on a smooth manifold, and take an element in the Lie algebra of the torus. So this is the tangent uh, at the identity to the torus. Now, from that element, from that element x, you can generate, you can define a vector field using it in a in a very standard way. This this you do as follows. So you start with x, okay? Now, using the exponential map, you get a curve in the torus. And now using your action, your group action, you get a curve in the manifold that passes through the point P. And now you take that tangent, the, the tangent vector to that curve at the, at, the, at, the, at the initial value, and you obtain, uh, you obtain a vector. So this is how you define the vector field generated by x. And now we say that the smooth T action is symplectic if all these vector fields are symplectic, and we say that it's Hamiltonian if all these vector fields are Hamiltonian. Okay? And all these vector fields, uh, are they still going to commute, right, or not? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Now, there is a very special type of map that you can assign to a, to a Hamiltonian torus action, and this is, the, this is the famous momentum map, which was introduced formally by Constant and Soriao in the, in the early 1960s independently, <laughs> but that certainly was already known to Lee in some form, in some specific form, uh, already in the 19th century. Uh, so suppose this is how you define the map. Suppose that you have a torus of dimension m acting on a manifold of dimension 2n. Because the torus has dimension m, the Lie algebra has dimension m, so you can take a basis of the Lie algebra of the torus. And now, because I'm assuming that my action is Hamiltonian, to these Lie algebra elements, there are vector fields that correspond to these Lie algebra elements, okay? And because the action are, is Hamiltonian, by definition, all these vector fields are Hamiltonian. So they have a, ham a set of Hamiltonians associated to them. And now you just put them all together. And you get, because each of them is real value, you get a map into RM. Okay, this is the so-called momentum map. And you can see the, the way to construct it is very straightforward and it's also pretty canonical. But it's not completely canonical because, of course, Hamilton's equations you can solve up to a constant. So you have, that's why the momentum map we can say is unique up to translations in RM. And then I can choose many bases of the Lie algebra of T, which is related by a transformation in GLMC. So this momentum map is also unique up to one of these GLMC transformations. Okay? The simplest example of the momentum map is the one that corresponds to the, uh, the Hamiltonian action of the circle by rotation in the two sphere, which just takes one point, the point uh, alpha h. How can you point with this? Uh, oops. Okay. Takes a point alpha h and you just rotate by an element in the circle and it takes you to that point. So you just rotate about the vertical axis horizontally. And the momentum map in this case just has one component, which is precisely the height function. So you see the image of the momentum map is the interval negative 1, 1, which is this co the compact interval negative 1, 1. And you can see that this interval is also obtained as the image of the, uh, under the momentum map of the fixed points, which are the north and the south pole. You agree, right? So the north and the south pole are the only points that are fixed by this action. You map them under the momentum map, which is the height function, and you get 1 and negative 1. You take the convex hull of that, and you get the interval 1, negative 1. So now you can wonder, is it possible that it is true that the image of this momentum map is always a, something which is convex? And this was suspected for many years. And there were, it was known in many examples. In particular, Constant has some general results, but it was not until the early 80s that Atiyah and Gilman and Sternberg verified this in general. So they proved that if you have a torus of dimension m, which is acting on a compact manifold uh, in a Hamiltonian way, then the image of this, of this map, of the momentum map, is a convex polytope in Rm. And this polytope you obtain by uh, looking at the fixed point set of the action, mapping the fixed point set under the action, you get a collection of points in Rm, you take the convex hull of these points, and you obtain a polytope in Rm. So that's the, the image of the momentum map. So this is very non-obvious, of course, uh, because the image of the map, or the momentum map, in principle, could be anything. But in, most, in the examples that were known, it was always convex. So there was a suspicion that this is true in general. And this suspicion was very, the, the, the proof of this was given by Atiyah <laughs> and Gilman and Sturmer independently 
in two papers. So this is, this is almost telling you that uh, there is quite a bit of rigidity on a, on a Hamiltonian torus action. Now, there, a few years later, Del Sun proved that in the particular case that the torus is precisely half the dimension of the manifold, so in this very particular case, this polytope that you obtain contains all the information about the manifold, the symplectic form, and the torus action. And these manifolds, uh, which therefore are classified by a polytope, are called now symplectic toric manifolds. Okay, so now you can, ans you can ask yourself, so, okay, so let me give you an example. Uh, consider CPN with the rotational TN action. You can set up the, the moment map equation and you obtain that the momentum map for this action is given by that formula and the polytope is given by the convex hull of the origin and uh, a lambda multiple of the canonical basis vectors in RM. So from the point of view of simplated geometry, the Lausanne theorem tells you that all the information about CPN with a lambda multiple of the Fubini study form and the rotational T in action is contained in a polytope. So it's a wonderful theorem. It's also telling you that the situation is quite rigid. So you can ask, uh, so let me make a brief historical remark. As I mentioned before, uh, a lot of the notions that I'm discussing now were already known to Lee in some form. He, he, of course, was one of the most influential figures in geometry and dynamics, and he was already aware of what symplectic and Hamiltonian vector fields were, of course, transformation groups, and in some instances, the momentum map. So Constant and Soriao defined the, the momentum map in a very, very general setting that certainly Lee was not aware of, but he already uh, knew it in some very particular instances. Okay. So I've given you some structure theorem for, Hamil for Hamiltonian actions. So now you can, you, you can ask the question, what happens if the vector fields that generate my action are not Hamiltonian, but they still have flows which preserve the symplectic form, okay? And I claim that this is not a generalization of the Hamiltonian picture. I claim that this is the first thing you consider. So most of the theorems are for Hamiltonian actions, but th that comes after. So this is, this is, I like to think of symplectic actions as the first natural case, rather as a generalization of Hamiltonian actions. So you can ask the question, what happens if you have, do you have some theorems like the atilla gilman sternberg theorems that are true for the vector fields generated by, uh, uh, um, by an action which is symplectic? So do you have some theorems for actions that are symplectic but not Hamiltonian? And you can ask the question, well, probably this is, uh, there are, these are complicated examples, and the answer is no. Uh, you can very easily find examples. For example, take the two torus and now have one, com one circle rotate on one component of the two torus. That's a free action, has no fixed points, and this is, this is a symplectic action. It's an area preserving action, but it's not Hamiltonian. So in particular, any free action that you construct uh, will not be Hamiltonian. And the reason is that Hamiltonian uh, torus actions, they always have fixed points. So if you have any action which doesn't have fixed points, it is not going to be Hamiltonian. For example, a free action. So this can be, this can be, uh, this, this can be checked. Now, here is an example, uh, a famous example by Kodaira, which is the, the Kodaira variety or Kodaira Thurston manifold. This is an example of a compact connected symplectic four manifold in which you have an action of a two torus which is symplectic, but is not Hamiltonian. And you, so you construct this as follows. You take R2 cross T2, that's a compact for, sorry, that's a connected four manifold, and now you have the lattice Z2 act on the, so this is a compact, for, sorry, a connected four manifold, yet now you have the lattice Z2 act on this product, and the way you have it act is by the diagonal action, where on the leftmost component, the R2, you, you're just acting by the inclusion, and on the right component, you're acting by this group of matrices. So when you do that, uh, you obtain a compact, when you take that quotient, you obtain a compact connected symplectic four manifold, and on this compact connected symplectic four manifold, you have a natural symplectic form, which descends from the form on the product, and you also have an action, which is as follows, a T2 action, which is, a, which is as follows, one circle is acting on the leftmost component of R2, and the other circle is acting on the rightmost component of T2. 
And that action is not well defined upstairs, but when you pass to the quotient, you can prove that it's well defined. So this is a free action, and it's a symplectic free action, but it's not Hamiltonian. So this is an example where you have, uh, when you have a symplectic action of a two torus on a compact connected symplectic four manifold, which is not Hamiltonian. This example was rediscovered by Thurston, and now uh, is sometimes called the Codera Thurston manifold as the first example, which is uh, of a symplectic manifold, which is non kähler So for for a few years, this was a question that wasn't that was up in the air if you, if every symplectic manifold is scalar and Thurston gave this example proving that that's, that's, that's not the case. The reason is that this, this has first been number three so it cannot be a Kähler manifold. Okay, so th this is the outline for the remaining of the talk. So far I have been in this inner circle which is Hamiltonian actions and now I want to move a little bit to the left by considering more general actions which are symplectic but not Hamiltonian, and a little bit to the right by considering integrable systems. So Hamiltonian actions may be viewed as a particular case of these cases. You can view them as a particular case of integrable systems, and you can also view them as a particular case of more general symplectic actions. Ah. So for this, let me uh, start by recalling what we mean by a Lagrangian submanifold. If you have a manifold of dimension 2n, and you consider a submanifold of dimension n, inside of the manifold M, we say that this Lagrangian, if when you restrict the symplectic form to it, you get zero. So that's a Lagrangian submanifold. And here is the first classification theorem that Hans Deutschmann and I proved for symplectic actions. Um, it, this says the following. Suppose that you have a torus T acting on a compact manifold of dimension 2N, and suppose that the action is symplectic, okay? And suppose that there is a Lagrangian orbit. This in particular forces the action of the torus to be half the dimension of the manifold. Suppose that there is a Lagrangian orbit. Then your, your torus decomposes as a product of two subtorus, two subtori, one I call TH and another I call TF. TH is because this, this subtorus is acting in a Hamiltonian way on the manifold, and TF is because this subtorus is acting in a free way in the manifold. So that's the first statement. If you have an action of a torus with a Lagrangian orbit, then your torus decomposes as a product of two subtori. One is acting on the manifold in a Hamiltonian way, and the other is acting in a free way. And your manifold looks as follows. It is, it is a vibration, and the base of the vibration is a torus bundle over a torus. So this is my manifold. My manifold is a vibration, and the base of the vibration is a torus bundle over a torus, and the fibers are symplectic toric manifolds. And how does the torus act here? the torus acts in the following way. The Hamiltonian part acts on each of the fibers, leaving them invariant, and the free part permutes the fibers, okay? So if you like, this case, the case when there is a Lagrangian orbit, is a mixture of the free case and the Hamiltonian case. In the free case, this disappears, and you have a torus bundle over a torus, which is the Godera Thurston manifold. In the Hamiltonian case, this disappears, and you just have a toric variety. In the case that you have a Lagrangian orbit, you have a mixture of both situations, a mixture of the free case and the Hamiltonian case, and then you have to twist it. Okay, so let's see a picture of an example of one of these manifolds. So this is a 10-dimensional symplectic manifold that is compact and has an action of a five-dimensional torus for which the orbits are Lagrangian. So this manifold is constructed in the following way. This is a torus bundle over a torus. It's the Codera Thurston manifold. And now over the Codera Thurston manifold, I have a vibration by toric varieties, which are CP3s. Okay, so this has dimension four. And over each point here, I have a toric variety, CP3. And here I have an action of a five-dimensional torus. So I have a five-dimensional torus, and now uh, this decomposes into a three-dimensional torus, which acts on each fiber, leaving them invariant in a Hamiltonian way, and a two-torus, which acts on the base and permutes the fibers. So that's the general case. Okay? So in the free case, this is what you have. In the Hamiltonian case, this is what you have. In the case you have a Lagrangian orbit, a mixture of both. Yeah? 
Okay. So this is a theorem in any dimension. Now, if you restrict to dimension four, um, and you consider an action of a two torus, you can actually give a complete classification in terms of all such manifolds. So let me quickly go through it. The first case is a toric variety. So you should, of course, recover the Hamiltonian case. The first case is a toric variety. Then you have a locally free action, which is a uh, symplectic uh, tor torus bundle over a two-dimensional uh, orbifold. Then you have a uh, torus bundle over a torus with Lagrangian fibers, and then the sphere across the torus. And you may think, well, what is special about dimension four that you can classify, and you can classify in higher dimensions. What is special about dimension four is that when you restrict the symplectic form, you can only get uh, to a two-dimensional submanifold. You can only get that it's symplectic, or, you, or that the manifold uh, uh, is Lagrangian. So there are only these two cases, so it makes the analysis, mu the analysis much easier. Okay. Okay. And now as a corollary of this result, uh, Hans Doisemann and I proved that if you can put a uh, two torus action which is symplectic on a four manifold, then that manifold is complex. It's a complex manifold and it admits an invariant uh, complex structure. And we were also able to uh, prove that all of most of them are Kähler with the exception of the Lagrangian torus bundle over a torus. And the, the way we, uh, we came to, to prove this is uh, that this, this case here is precisely, uh, corresponds precisely to uh, one case in Kodera's classification of complex analytic surfaces. It corresponds to the case of uh, those that admit a nowhere vanishing holomorphic 2, 0 form, okay? Okay, so now let me move to the second part of the talk, which is Hamiltonian systems. And here I'm going to restrict the, throughout the entire time, to dimension four. Um, so a Hamiltonian system is just a symplectic manifold, which in my case I'm going to assume to be four-dimensional, equipped with a Hamiltonian, which is just smooth map from the manifold into the real numbers. And now we say that this Hamiltonian system is integrable if there exists as another smooth map from M to R, such that if you consider the Hamiltonian vector field generated by you the first map and the second map, these, these vector fields are linearly independent almost everywhere. And of course, the almost everywhere is essential, meaning that it is precisely where that, at the places where that doesn't happen, that singularities of the system occur. And the most interesting features of integrable systems uh, happen precisely at the singularities. Okay. And my notation is going to be as follows. Uh, I frequently call the integrable system itself, I frequently call this map F, which comes from putting both components of the system together, the, the integrable system. Okay, this is equivalent. So this is the object that I want to discuss in this second part of the talk. Okay, so a Hamiltonian system is a smooth manifold with uh, with a smooth, sorry, it's a symplectic manifold with smooth map. We say that this integral, if you can find another smooth map such that the Hamiltonian vector fields generated by the first map and the second map are linearly independent almost everywhere. And I think I forgot to say this before. And you want that the Poisson brackets of J and H commute. And this is the same as saying that J is constant along the flow of the Hamiltonian vector field generated by H or in other words, J is a motion integral. And this condition is symmetric, so you can also reverse. Just assume you have one integral of motion here, or? Yes, just one, okay. yes. Because I'm in, yes, I'm in dimension four, and I start with, uh, with one H, and I get another J, yes, exactly. Now here is a famous example, it's a spherical pendulum on the, the cotangent bundle of S2, and here you have the form for the Hamiltonian. So this is a Hamiltonian system, and you can check that this integrable just by taking the component J to be, to be that. Okay, so now what singularities can an integrable system have? Um, so in the case of dimension four, there are five singularities that you can have in this setting. Uh, let me start by the easiest one. So the first one is elliptic elliptic, which corresponds to a fixed point, if you like. So that's that's the five, that's the rightmost case. Then you have you can have transversally elliptic singularities. 
and the fiber over that singularity is like that, it's a circle. Here you have a focus focus fiber, which is a two dimensional torus where you pinch, you have a circle in the torus and you pinch it to a point. So you get a focus focus fiber and you can pinch as many times as you like. And then finally here you have a regular fiber. And there is one type of singularity that I'm not considering and those are um, uh, hyperbolic singularities. And the reason is because I want to describe cl classification theorems and somewhat having hyperbolic si singularities makes it very difficult to describe global invariants. So I have to rule them, to we have to rule them out and this is certainly a case that needs to be addressed. It's just that with the current techniques we have, the, the, this, is, this is not possible because as I said, hyperbolic singularities, they have a tendency to, to destroy uh, the global picture. So we cannot do it yet, but it's certainly a case that I would like to be able to do. Um, so does that mean you're just omitting that from your list there or what? Yes, I'm ruling it out from my list. Exactly, exactly. So I'm showing, I'm showing the ones that, that show, yeah. And what is a singular fiber? Of course, it's a fiber that contains a singularity and a regular fiber is a fiber that contains no singularity. So this, this, the two cases on the right, they already appear in the case of torus actions. The one, the focus focus fiber is unique to integral of systems. Okay. Now, what happens around the regular fibers? Because of course, if we don't know what happens around regular fibers, uh, there is no hope that we know we can figure out what happens about singular fibers around singular fibers. So on regular fibers, the dynamics is very simple, and this is described by the action angle theorem of uh, Arnold and Mineux. Uh, this theorem was at least already stated by Mineux uh, in the case of R2n, and then it was rediscovered by Arnold who gave, uh, who gave a complete proof of this theorem. At least Mineux stated it and proof, proof, uh, proved it in some, uh, in some cases, although there are some, apparently there are some gaps. Um, uh, okay, so if, uh, so the theorem says the following, take a neighborhood of a regular, you can always find a regular, uh, a neighborhood of regular fiber that looks like T2 cross R2. And the, the components of the integrable system are just the projections onto R2. The first component is the projection onto the first component of R2 and the second component is the second projection. Uh, on the second component of R2. So from the point of view of dynamics, around a regular fiber, nothing much interesting happened. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about semi-toric systems, which is the type of systems that I have been interested, the most interested in. And a semi-toric system is, is the following. It's an integrable system, but I require that one of the components of the systems generates a two pi periodic flow. Okay, this is not true. In general, the, the components could wind around indefinitely. They, this need not happen. It's, a, it's quite a restriction, but I'm going to assume that. I'm going to assume that one, one component of the system generates a vector field that has a two by periodic flow. And the other can do anything. The other can move, can move uh, completely freely. So now you see that the name semi-toric is because this is somewhere in between toric, which is both components are two pi periodic, and completely general, which is you don't require anything on either component. So I'm going to require one component to generate a two pi periodic flow. And I'm going to assume that the singularities are also non-degenerate and non-hyperbolic. So like the Keplero problem? Say that again? Like the Keplero problem? Or yes. Is it it's probably a case of this. I haven't checked. But do you have hyperbolic singularities there? You probably have. Uh, ah. Probably. But it was a Kepler in 2006, Yes. Which was mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the energy surface is conjugated to the, the basic flow for the ones here. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 So in, in the particular case that, uh, in our particular case, this means that you can have these three types of singularities, transversally elliptic, 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 and focus, focus. And this is the normal form that you have for each of them. Um, okay, so why semi-toric systems? So I already said um, that this is the next natural object after toric systems, but semi-toric systems, as we will see, they have a much richer, less rigid structure. And 
this is for mathematicians and for physicists and chemists, they were actually the first to become interested in these semi-toric systems. And there have been many groups working on this in various places, including Mark Child's group in Oxford, some groups in France and Ohio State. So they were interested in semi-toric systems in the context of quantum molecular spectroscopy. So they wanted to describe the energy momentum spectra. And they wanted to be able to recover the system from the spectrum. So in order to be able to do this, you first need to have a clear understanding of the symplectic invariance of the classical system. And then you hope that from the spectrum, you can actually recover this symplectic invariance and then recover the system. So this was, this was our motivation. Um, you have many examples of semi-toric systems. One of them is the coupled spin oscillator, which just comes from coupling the, the spin on the sphere with the harmonic oscillator on R2. And this system is given by these two components. It's a non-compact uh, system. And the J and the H are given by this formula. Uh, you can, for example, already see in the J that corresponds to rotating on the two sphere. This corresponds to rotating about the two sphere. Sorry, this corresponds to rotating on R2, and this corresponds to rotating on the two sphere. So the J generates a two pi periodic flow. And this system has precisely one focus focus singularity, which is a pinch torus, and happens at that point. <coughs> Other examples are the spherical pendulum, the Lagrange top, the two body problem. There are many examples that Sorry, fit this. A pinch torus is, is a fiber, are you saying? Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. The pinch fiber is, is the fiber that contains this point. Yeah. So here, this is the point. <coughs> yeah. OK, so you can ask the questions, can you classify these systems? And if you come from the angle of the, the del Sun, atilla gilman sturmer theorem, that's precisely what they did in the context of Hamiltonian actions. So you want to see to what extent you can construct invariants that classify these systems. Um, so this is what my collaborators, San Wu and Gok and I did recently. We proved that there is a collection of four invariants that you can assign to a semi-toric system, which completely classified. The first of these invariants is the polygon, OK? Surely you should have a polygon, because the del Sand classification tells you that uh, all the information about your symplectic four manifold with a two-torus action is encoded in this polygon, OK? So you should have a polygon here, because this is a more general case. Now, this polygon is not the image of the momentum map, because when you do the image of your system, you get something which is not a polygon. It's, it's something else. It's, uh, but you can do symplectic cutting on this polygon and get a polygon. And that's the first invariant that you get. And then, in addition to this polygon, you should, you should have somewhat information about the singularities of the system. And this information about the singularities of the system is contained in these two items here. So somewhat you should have information about the symplectic geometry and the symplectic dynamics around a focus-focus fiber. And that information is contained here. It's contained uh, in these two invariants. So roughly speaking, this Taylor series invariance tells you, uh, this classifies the dynamics around a regular, uh, around a focus focus fiber. So the, the theorem is the following. Uh, the theorem is the following. Suppose that you have, that you look at a focus focus fiber. And suppose that you look at the foliation around the focus focus fiber, OK? That's a, that's a semi-global picture. Now, the theorem says that if you have two such foliations, then you can assign to them a Taylor series on two variables. And then the foliations are isomorphic, if and only if the Taylor series are the same. And what do I mean by the, the foliations are isomorphic? I mean that there is one diffeomorphism from the first semi-global neighborhood to the second one, which preserves the fibers and also preserves the symplectic form. OK? You see what I'm saying, right? You have a neighborhood of a focus-focus fiber, and here another neighborhood of a focus-focus fiber. To each of them, you can assign a Taylor series on two variables. And these two uh, neighborhoods are isomorphic if and only if the Taylor series are the same. And what do we mean by isomorphism? We mean a diffeomorphism, which takes one neighborhood to the other and maps leaves to leaves, and is also symplectic, preserves the symplectic form. And finally, there is an invariant that we call the twisting index invariant, uh, which 
For a long time, we thought it was zero, so we were puzzled with this invariant. We were on hold with the paper for about a year, trying to prove that this is actually zero always. So we didn't believe that this was an invariant. But finally, we were able to prove that um, not only this is not zero, but it can be any integer. So we were able to construct systems that have this twist and index invariant have any integer. So this is, this is an invariant that came to, as a surprise to us, and it also was not predicted in, by, by any of the physicists and chemists. Um, OK, so maybe I'm going to skip the idea of the proof. Let me go back briefly to the couple of spin oscillator example. In this case, the image of the momentum map is the interior of this curve here, OK? And the picture on the right is the polygons that you obtain by doing symplectic cutting on this image. So the picture on the right encodes essentially all the information about the coupled spin oscillator. These numbers here, these numbers here correspond to the, to the Taylor series invariant. And this, this letter H corresponds to the so-called height invariant, which is a geometric invariant that sort of <coughs> tells you how the position of the singularities affects the system. Um, okay. Now, this is the reconstruction theorem that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so I, or just a couple of minutes ago, I told you that we thought that the twisting index had to be 0. But then we were able to prove that from, from any twisting index, from any integer, you can construct a system whose twisting index is precisely the one you start with. So it's very, very far from being 0. It actually can be anything. So this is the, this is the reconstruction theorem, which again was inspired by the Del San theorem. So Del San proved that if you start from any polytope, you can reconstruct a system whose momentum polytope is precisely the one you start with. So here you want to do the same for semi-toric systems, and this is what we did. But of course, we, you have more invariance because your system is much more flexible. <coughs> so here we prove that you can start from any polygon, uh, from any uh, collection of points inside of the polygon, where the position does matter then to each of these points you assign a Taylor series on two variables and then to, uh, to each of these points you assign an integer. And that's what we call the twisting index. The twisting index somewhat tells you how it's a global invariant which is dynamical, somewhat tells you uh, how the vibration al uh, about a particular point stands with respect to the vibration at the other points. So. Uh, that's the best interpretation that I can give right now. Um, OK. Yes? Yes. It's probably something like that. I would, I would very much like to be able to formulate it in known terms. That would be, that would be wonderful. And this doesn't appear if you just wa have one, one singularity. So in the case of the couple spin oscillator, you just have a focus focus singularity. So there is no twisting index. It's only when there are two that there is some interaction that is not always trivial. And uh, I'm not sure it's, ex it's probably, it must be related. Uh, uh, yes. OK. Now I have to say that we can construct abstractly a large modular space of systems that uh, have non-trivial twisting index, but we don't know any example that has non-trivial twisting index that comes from physics. So all the ones we know have twisting index zero. When you said it comes from physics and chemistry, are, are you talking about the quantum counterparts? Or yes, I'm talking about the quantum counterparts, yes, so yes. What, what does your, what does your uh, theorem say about the, the quantum counterparts? Exactly, so the, what the theorem says is the following. Uh, when you find the spectrum of this, you suppose that you're given the spectrum of a, of a system which is semi-toric. This is two, two uh, self-adjoint semi-classical operators that commute. And now from that spectrum, you, the, go the hope is that you should be able to detect the symplectic invariance that I just described, these four symplectic invariants from that spectrum, and then use the, these theorems to reconstruct the system. So that was the goal from the beginning, to given the spectrum of a semi-toric system, uh, detect in the, the spectrum the invariance of the system, and then from those invariants reconstruct the classical system. This was our goal all along. But of course, to do that, you first need to do the to need to know what the invariants are. So these these two theorems that I describe 
now I, I, now I can say that they, for us they were just preparatory theorems for what want, we want to do next. But this is an absolutely required step because if you have a spectrum but you, you, don't, know, uh, you don't know what you have to well, detect. Like inverse problem, exactly. Yeah. It's, a, it's an inverse problem. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so this, I, I was going to describe the Taylor series invariance, but let me, let me skip that. Um, and let me get to make just a couple of remarks about the spectral theory. So suppose that you have a symplectic manifold and you suppose that you have a Hilbert space depending on this, on the parameter H, uh, which quantizes the manifold. And of course you can ask, you know, why can you do that? And the answer is, there is no, uh, I, have, I don't have a good answer. You can do this in some cases, but you, can, you cannot always do that. But at least from the point of view of physics, it is natural to start directly from, in the, in, from the uh, assuming that you have the Hilbert space. Okay, so a quantum integrable system consists of two self-adjoint semi-classical operators on each Hilbert space, depending on H. So I'm not writing the H for the operators, but of course there should be an H also. Which they commute and such that their principal symbols form a classical integrable system on the manifold. And now this is the spectral conjecture, which was, uh, has been, is currently our main project and uh, the background to prove this conjecture was developed in the previous papers. So the, the conjecture is the following. A semi-toric system is determined completely up to isomorphisms by the joint spectrum of the quantum system. So the joint spectrum of the quantum system is just a collection of points in R2, which you need to have for each value of, for a sequence of values of H approaching zero. So of I would like of course, to not have this, I would like to say that if you know, if you just know it for one value of h, then you're going to be able to do it. But I, I think that's probably not possible. But it's very reasonable to ask that, uh, and we can, we we have we have a sketch of this in some in some cases, uh, that from the joint spectrum of the system, as h approaches zero, you can recover the system completely. So let me show you a picture of this. Uh, this is the coupled spin oscillator example. Let me go back to the coupled spin oscillator. I can show you what it looks like. So this is the coupled spin oscillator. The image of the momentum map is the interior in this curve, okay? And here is the, the joint spectrum of the coupled spin oscillator. And of course, I'm not telling you how we can quantize it, but the quantization is done like the physicists have done it. Uh, uh, have always done it for this particular example. So this is the spectrum corresponding to a value of h for the coupled spin oscillator. Now, you see that the spectrum fits exactly in the image of this, moment of this map, as, as, it, as it should be, okay? Now, you see the, the way that the spectrum, be, the spectrum points are distributed already tells you where there is a singularity. So something obviously is going on on the, on the x-axis, right, in the spectrum. So that precisely it is because the system has a focus-focus singularity and the image is precisely there. So you can already see from this spectrum you are going to be able to recover the image of the system completely. So what value of h bar do you have? Is that a very tiny value of h? Yeah, that's a tiny value, that's yeah. Yeah, that's a very tiny value of h. If I pick a larger value, what will I get? Ah, if you pick a larger value, then uh, you're not going to be able to deduce this image very clearly. The points will be much more spread out. Will they, will they jump out of that zone? Then? No, they will not jump out. Yeah, they will not jump out. Yes. Yes, but they are probably, uh, they are in our simulation, they, they came much closer here. So we were farther away from the curve. So they fit somewhat when you increase the value of h, the curve, these, these limits to this curve. While if you do a, a larger value of h, this comes, is, is not so clear. So you have to do large values of h to be able to detect the, the system. Now, we have, so from here you can see it's very conceivable that you can actually recover the, the polytope invariant, because the polytope is constructed from the image of the momentum map. So we have been able to do this heuristically. So there is a paper uh, in the archive in which we explain how from this spectrum you can recover the spin oscillator system uh, completely. 
And when I mean completely, I mean um, that we were able to compute the, the Taylor series invariance for the, singular, for the singular fiber, but only the linear part. So the rest, we just don't know how to compute it. But I believe that it should be possible to uh, compute, to prove that from that spectrum, you can recover the, the Taylor series invariant, even if you cannot compute it. So what we did, what we have done, is to actually compute it. From this spectrum, we computed it. And we got five logarithms of two and pi, something like that. And that was precisely what you get if you do the computation in the, class for the, in the classical case. So we were only able to do this in the linear case. And the reason is because the, the proof uses formulas from microlocal analysis that are only known for, for the linear terms. Um, but as I said, I believe that you can prove that from that, from the way the spectrums accumulate around here, you can recover the Taylor series invariant, even if you cannot compute it. But we haven't done this yet. But I believe that that's possible. Uh, Okay, so further research, uh, well, there are many questions. So first, I'm going to say one that I find uh, that, that I'm very much interested in right now, which is there is a long-standing principle in integrable system which says that from the bifurcation set, you should be able of a system, which is in the, in the case of compact manifolds, just the image of the set of of critical points, so the set of critical values, you should be able to recover information about the system. And this is known for many concrete examples, but I'm not very aware of general results. Uh, so this is some preliminary result that to the right to you, Sam <coughs> and myself have, have been trying to prove, and we, uh, we have a proof now pending revision, when I mean we have a proof, Sam was actually here until yesterday. So, so the proof is, is very much still warm. Uh, um, so, the, so the claim, so that's why I say pin the revision, the claim is that if you have a compact manifold and you have an integrable system that has no hyperbolic singularities, then if the image of the set of critical values has no horizontal tangencies, the fibers are connected. So in the literature, most results start with the assumption that you have a singular Lagrangian vibration with connected fibers. What we wanted to do is to see when, that actu when that's actually the case. Suppose that you have an integrable system. This is a singular Lagrangian vibration. Can you tell when the fibers are connected? And the answer is from the bifurcation set. If it has no horizontal tangencies, then the fibers are connected. And this assumption, at least in applications, is easy to check. So let's look at this example. There are the regular part is outside of this. There are clearly no horizontal tangencies here. On the critical set, this is the critical set. So all the tangencies are, are non-zero. So that applies to that, to that example. And we also have some theorems in the non-compact case. So this, is, this theorem is, um, you're, back, you're still in four dimensions here. I'm still in four dimensions, yes. I believe, actually, that's an excellent question. I believe that the argument here, which is uh, uses local theory of integrable systems that mainly Morse theory, that this can be done in our end. While the classification results I, I mentioned, I, I think it would be extremely difficult to get them in our end, even in the sixth dimension. I do think that this result you can do in any dimension. That it's just, it's just gonna, be, it's gonna be work for sure. Because our proof right now uh, is, is in only in, this, in dimension four. But because Morse theory works in any dimension, I expect that, uh, that this is going to work in any, in any dimension. But I'm, I'm not sure, of course. But that's a great question. Um, OK, so you can ask, you know, do you have any connectivity results for general systems? Um, and then there are many other questions. One thing that we haven't analyzed, which I, which I think would be interesting, is to see what the structure of the modular space of semi systems has. So when you vary the invariance, what do you have? So what we have right now is we have a collection of invariants that determine the system. Some of them are discrete, but some of them are not. So you want to know what, how they vary. So this is something we have, not, we have not analyzed yet. And then the theory, the spectral conjecture, this is our main goal, which is in dimension four right now only. And this is sort of our main, uh, this, is the, this is our main interest right now. It's not even clear that this is true for toric systems. Uh, 
much less for semi-toric systems. But we, we believe that for toric systems, we more or less know how to do it. But this is not written up or anything. So it, it could be, you know, it, presumably various difficulties can appear. But I believe that for toric systems, at least this, 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 this should be possible. And for semi-toric systems as well. And then you can ask the questions, you know, what happens if you add hyperbolic singularities, which I think is going to complicate things very much. And what happens if you look at uh, semi-toric existence in, in dimension greater than four, like six or eight. I think in dimension six, I already don't know how to do it because in dimension six, you have a polygon. Sorry, you have a three-dimensional image of the singular momentum map. And presumably, I don't know how to get a polygon from that. Uh, presumably, it's, it's possible, but I, I don't know how to do it. So I expect this to be difficult, to be very difficult, the, that case. But San, San and I, San Bungok and I, we are more or less working in dimension four and trying to see everything that we can say in dimension four. Um, okay. Uh, so, okay, so this is a picture of Hans Deutschmann uh, in 2005, so he passed away last year. Um, and these are the reference. Thank you very much. <clears throat>